Uh, please welcome up University of Waterloo Professor John Zellick. to get wired up first. Um, I'm actually wearing two hats up here. One is a university professor and another one as um, a founder of a startup company called Tactile Sight. So I'm going to be talking about what we have done and what, where we're headed as well. Um, about just over half a dozen years ago, um, now let me just um, backtrack. My training is as a roboticist, and about a decade ago when I um, obtained my first academic position, I thought that's what I would have to do. Then I realized, hey, I can do anything I want to do as long as someone will fund it. So um, just over half a dozen years ago, I approached the CNIB, which is the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, and I said I had this idea where we would strap a stereo camera on someone and um, we would convey that information through a tactile modality on a glove. And the inspiration of how the um, information was conveyed on the glove was based on linguists um, about spatial prepositions. It's interesting that in most languages, there's a finite number of spatial prepositions to describe the world. And we use that as a basis. So in, in a nutshell, on the glove, the experiments that we did perform, um, we described if an object was to the left, the uh, baby finger would vibrate, the um, index finger, something was in front of you, and the thumb, something to the right, and the intensity of vibration inversely correlated with how far things were away. And, um, and this would be updated three times a second. We performed experiments, um, the people just loved the tool. Then, then we looked into um, commercializing it, and the problem is that, well, the system, the stereo camera that we use, cameras are ubiquitous and inexpensive. However, um, the whole issue of calibrating a stereo camera, you have to precisely machine it, and that's where the costs come in. So um, the unit would cost in excess, it would cost us over $2,000 to make it. And the demographics of people that are blind, people are usually poor and unemployed. And kind of the sweet spot is a couple of hundred dollars. So um, we went to the drawing board and something that we came up with a few years ago, rather than having an embodiment of conveying information on the glove, we thought of a belt. The notion of a belt has an inherent coordinate system associated with it. And the control unit, um, we put in um, a highly precise GPS, inertial sensors, altimeter, um, compass. The, um, the G GPS unit actually was tested in the um, London Underground around the Waterloo Station. And um, a person in the tube was um, being tracked for about a kilometer. So it's highly sensitive, quite sophisticated. And you might say, well, why have um, a belt with a GPS? Cell phones have GPS. The neat thing is that the interface to the unit, if this was our cell phone, we'd make use of Google, Ma Google Maps to interface. There's no need to do reduplicate the interface. That would define the destination. The collection of waypoints would be downloaded to the control unit on the belt. And these waypoints would guide a person by nudging them in the left or right direction. And if we can make use of other sensors, the more sensors, the better fix we can get in terms of geography. So um, we can make use of additional GPS on um, the cell phone if need be. We all, currently, where we're at, we have uh, various prototypes at the Make Fair tonight. I'll be presenting one of the latest prototypes we have of this tactile belt. Um, the American Alzheimer's Association has sponsored us, and an organization, the Toronto Rehab Institute, is currently conducting field trials um, with Alzheimer's patients for us. The target demographic that we're going after is the assistive devices market. Um, people that are blind and people with Alzheimer's. But there's a whole slew of other verticals that we want to target. 
So what we're really dealing with here is we're providing geocentric information and conveying it through a tactile modality. Um, we want to, where we're headed in, in the lab is kind of taken from the previous slide using the camera that we want to also convey egocentric information as well. And this next couple of slides will describe some of the work that we're doing. Well, it's the same slide. There it is. So one of the things we're looking at, oops, how do I get the video clip to play? <laughs> one of the things we're looking at is object category recognition. Um, so if we can recognize categories, this is a video clip that should be played. <laughs> um, so recognizing cars, recognizing people, so associating labels with things that are out there. Um, this really is a video clip that actually plays. <laughs> there, there we go. Um, so recognizing vehicles on the fly, car, car, um, person. <laughs> the other thing that we're interested in for the egocentric is how far things are away. So this shows like with a stereo camera, but we don't want to use a stereo camera. So we've started to look at with a monocular camera. I kind of call this bird vision. If you take a look at a bird so standing in your backyard, there are magnificent flyers um, averting obstacles flying amongst trees. But they do not use stereo opsis because the beak is in the way and the two fields of view do not overlap. And in, in essence, what they do is they fly through and it's the motion that allows them to defer how far things are away. So we've been looking at, with um, great success, determining how far things are away with motion, but also incorporating inertial sensors. It's like us with our vestibular system and our vision system. If one goes, we get dizzy and we don't work. The two go hand in hand together to make sense of the world. The other thing we, we've been looking at is context. And again, we're in the same mode, um, not the video play mode. Um, that, that is a cue for the technician. Um, <laughs> we take a look at the video stream. There, there is a video stream here. This one doesn't matter that much. But it gets kind of disturbing when this video stream actually plays. And we take a look at the statistics mapping it into another, di told you it gets disturbing, into another dimension to determine what context we're in. Um, an urban setting, a downtown core, and we use that to determine what f objects or features we, we will look at. So that kind of ties into some of the work that we did um, in the area of visual SLAM. SLAM is an acronym um, mostly from the robotics field, simultaneous localization and mapping. And what we do is, it's kind of like GPS, but we're not using satellites. We're triangulating based on static features or static objects in the environment. And what we demonstrated um, in the video clip that I'm showing here is that we localized on tree trunks. Tree trunks aren't going to waver unless we have um, a severe storm. So static objects in the environment. Um, we worked with a mapping company that's a subsidiary of Trimble in Toronto, and they were interested in this for municipalities um, monitoring their assets. There are lots of tree canopies out in urban areas. The idea is the person, the um, surveyor would have a camera strapped to them and as they moved along if the GPS dropped out, the camera would take over and map where they are and what is um, around them. The other aspect that we've been looking at is how do we um, convey this information in a tactile modality. Show the two examples with a glove and a belt, but we're also looking at actuators, different types of technologies. The main emphasis is on wearable haptics. Haptics being um, the Greek word, coming from the Greek word haptikos, being able to touch. So creating, looking at different actuators to convey the most information, the most bandwidth possible. The application areas that we've been looking at besides assistive devices include the automotive sector, the, app, um, the work in visual slam. Um, we had interest last year and were awarded a contract from 
a major automotive company in the US. Well, they were major last year and they're not major this year, unfortunately. <laughs> so I had to put that timeline, timeline into perspective. Um, they're interested in augmenting the GPS with a camera to localize and get a better fix on the vehicle. Um, the company was GM Research and I haven't looked at the news today to see if they're filing for bankruptcy or not. And um, we, we still have the contract pending, but um, the per, our contacts from GM Research, I'm not sure if they have a job. So um, that's something we'll have to follow up with, if not them. Um, I think the auto sector is here to stay. But rather than having an embodiment as a belt, you, there are various other types of embodiment. The seat can be the interface, um, as opposed to relying the, on the auditory modality or the visual modality, which the driver in the vehicle is overstimulated already. The tactile modality is underutilized and makes a logical choice for conveying geographical information for providing direction. Another application, we've had interest from the Israeli Army and from the US Army um, with regards to our belt device for ground troops, for conveying um, geographical information on where to go and where they are in relationship to the other troops and providing command information. Another application is um, recreational use. Um, hiking, um, it, it's kind of, it, it's kind of silly to be walking around and enjoying nature and watching your GPS like this. Um, it would be more intuitive to have nudges along your waist to guide you to your um, final destination. And in closing, um, we're in the midst of doing field trials with Alzheimer's patients with the company Tactile Sight. Um, we've put a heavy emphasis on the vision part. Um, vision assisted uh, GPS, there's auto sector interest, um, ongoing research activities that are not that far, a couple of years from actually deploying and uh, doing field trials in the areas of vision recognition, depth from monocular vision, um, context recognition, visual slam, and also looking at wearable haptic actuators. Another piece of work, I have a fun project that I don't have any slides on, but I think it's kind of fitting with um, um, the um, theme today is um, my, my wife's an architect and an urban planner and for her PhD she studied sense of place, place. And I said, oh, wouldn't it be neat if I can throw all this technology and we can apply for a grant together and we can examine sense of place. So the premise for the grant was, um, um, what I mean by sense of place are what urban planners describe as sense of place. This is a beautiful area. Can we actually quantify this? And the premise behind this is um, a, a recent book by Christopher Alexander. If um, any of you are computer scientists, he um, coined the phrase object oriented for the architecture field and the computer sciences kind of um, borrowed that phrase and recently has a book called The Nature of Beauty. It's two and a half thousand pages that there is order in the world in terms of how we see and what is beautiful and what is not. And the fourth volume even deals with the proof that God actually exists. We'll discard the fourth volume for now but taking that premise and looking at the video streams um, We've had initial luck of being able to quantify that this is a beautiful area, this is not. I see my time is up. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.